Hello and welcome to the third of our mini Cheltenham Festival podcast for SBK. Hopefully you're enjoying this short and concise format and have tuned in for the previous two days because we've had plenty of winners along the way and it's been very enjoyable uh, start to the festival for both Ross and myself. Um, if you've not watched either of the first two, you should expect 15 minutes roughly from this podcast. We'll review a couple of the races that we saw on Wednesday and then preview every single race on Thursday. So sit back and relax and watch. Hopefully, I'll pick a few winners. My name's Tom Collins. This is Ross Miller. Ross, we had a pretty good day on Tuesday, as already mentioned. Wednesday was pretty strong as well. So far, we are filming this at 4.20, so there's still a couple of races to go. But we've had a couple of winners, including Ballyburn and Back to File. Who was your highlight so far on the Wednesday? Uh, I mean, ba- Ballyburn and Fact File, it's quite hard to split them. And it's almost Ballyburn is is going to be Fact File next year, isn't he? There's so many similarities, just the way they travel so powerfully. And I was watching it and, and I thought Fact File a little bit early, jumped a couple of fences a bit big when they weren't perhaps going to gallop. And I wondered whether, as we discussed, his relative inexperience might find him out. But the further they went into the race and the more the tempo picked up, he was the winner from any point from the last circuit really wasn't he He just got there very easily and didn't have to be overly dealt with to get up the hill he looks a really promising horse and as for Ballyburn he just he's a bit different with that low head carriage but he clearly has just got a massive massive engine Um, and okay they didn't land the supreme but you can see that this is a horse that stays so well you can understand why they came here rather than the supreme yeah, both of them were extremely impressive. Uh, another winner on the Wednesday was Langer Dan. And then in the champion chase, we saw a huge upset. A rare Willie Mullins favourite turned over in El Fabiolo. Sent off at one to five, made a few little mistakes in the first couple of fences, got to the fifth fence, passing the stands, terrible blunder and immediately pulled up. Ross, what did you make of El Fabiolo jumping up to the point where he made the mistake? And then what happened at the fifth? He, he jumped like Al Fabiolo jumps, didn't he? Certainly in the early part, you know, he takes a while to warm up and then absolutely landed on, on, on the top of one. And unfortunately, if, much of the discussion has been about how he's not a good jumper, but he always gets to the other side. Well, that remains the fact. He got to the other side, he stood up, he kept his rider in the plate. But when their hind legs go out behind them like that, you could see very quickly Paul Tannen was concerned about whether he'd done some damage. And you know, it highlights all the time the, the pressure cauldron they're in, the, the quick decisions they have to make in terms of position on a race course. But also Paul Tannen very, very quickly had to decide whether he could try and get back into contention or whether he had to look after that horse another day and, and try and make the best decision. And for my mind, as a as a horse lover, I would much rather see them back in the stables ready to go another day than anything sort of uh, untoward happened to them by trying to get back into a race. Absolutely agree with that. One thing, as you've obviously trained a lot of uh, jump show jumpers to get these horses to jump perfectly over poles for example in Czech Republic right now how would you get him to jump better moving forward because as you say that was like El Fabiolo jumps normally he makes mistakes he doesn't he's not exactly fluent over his fences yes he doesn't tend to put in a mistake like he did at the fifth but again he's not pinpoint accurate so how can he fix that it's tricky TC because it and it's where I come back to, oh, they're built like a chaser. For me, jumping is all about their brain and their brain there to link with their feet. And I'm not saying he's a stupid horse, but he just looks a bit numb. He doesn't seem to be able to read what's in front of him and, and adjust his body and his footfall accordingly. He seems to just run onto the fence. And if it's on a nice stride, he can cope. And if it's not, he finds a way to, to cope, but it's not particularly efficient. And uh, unfortunately, this time it caught him out. I suspect... As with most things, he'll get better with practice, but it's probably going to be always just in there as a as a, a slight Achilles heel, and would probably stop him from being one of the of the all time greats over uh, fences. But we have to say, Moscow Flyer had a mistake in him as well, and he's still seen as a sort of champion chase great. So it just adds to the uh, intrigue of a race, doesn't it? Yeah, almost certainly. And this was a horse who kind of looked bomb proof if he had a clear round coming into today. Big shock and. The bookmakers will be definitely pleased about that because of the Willie Mullins accumulators that were rolling over. Edward Stone also came down in the race. He was beaten at the time. Fortunately, he got up and looked okay. And the race was won by Captain Guinness. Another one for Rachel Blackmore. Another one for Henry de Bromhead. Before we provide our tips and overview for the races on Thursday, I'll mention that SBK is still running their double winnings offer. To use each day of this Cheltenham Festival, you can choose any horse in any race each day. You'll get paid out at double the odds. 18 plus max stakes do apply. Check out the terms and conditions for that one. Okay, let's look at day three. A much more enticing punting card for my liking. Seven races, as per usual, except for today when there was only six. Um, we begin with the Turner's Novices Chase. 
wide open market in here. I think it's still two to one, actually, the favourite, Fasal Vega, but it was four to one earlier in the week. There are some nice horses running. Obviously, I've mentioned Fasal Vega, Ginny's Destiny, Grey Dawning, Iroko. I won't be having a bet here. None of these really capture my imagination. What about you? Well, I've, I've gone in at Fasal Vega and I've got what might prove to be a nice price, you know, going early with him last week on the on the preview pod. Uh, I think he's going to like this ground. And just to go over what we said on the preview pod, if you haven't watched it, Crevega, his mother, stayed two mile four. She stayed three miles. It was a very, very good race mare. But her record at two miles, she ran four times. She only won two of them. They weren't her outstanding performances. This is a mare that stayed very well. The scientists would tell you that generally the, the mitochondria for stamina come from the mother. So it might well be that Fasal Vega has been running over the wrong trip and that Willie Muller's had a bit of a blind spot between what this horse shows him at home, which is clearly a lot of speed, and actually what he is on the on the race course. So I'm excited to see him. Oroco, I just loved what he did at Warwick. He's a bit of a niggler in my head in that I keep thinking JP was so insistent that Fat to File could go to the to the Browns advisory is this because they just know that Oroco has stepped forward so significantly from what he did over hurdles when of course last year he was winner of the Martin Pipe so he's an interesting one and if he stays around about 20 to 1 or maybe a bit bigger I might have a small bet on Jello each way I think he's a horse that could finish off well if there's plenty of pace on here um, I thought he shaped better than the result behind Nickelback last time which is a sort of race that got blown apart by Nickelback's very forward uh, style so those would be the two I'd be looking at uh, Passo Vega and Jello. Yeah, different ways to think of it. Uh, think about this first race on Thursday from Ross there. As I say, I don't have any opinion. So we'll move straight on to the Potemps final. One of my favourite races of the week, I have to say, from a betting perspective. SBK traders go 7-1 to one the field with Gordon Elliott trained Cleatus Pulor topping the bill. Do you like him or are you looking elsewhere? No, TC, I'm sticking with just my one selection, which is Lemilos, which is a Bigger price. He's been well found in the market. You know, we saw today that, that Dan Skelton can navigate his way through the handicaps and turn up here with a well-handicapped horse over hurdles. I'm hoping that's the case. The ground should still be soft enough for him. He's a high-class chaser. He looked to me last time like he uh, would improve for that effort at Ascot, and uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. Yeah, Lamilos is going to be part of my staking plan as well. Actually, he already is part. Managed to grab a little bit of a better price, as did you, Ross, uh, than he currently is now. I think he's 12 to 1. Lots of money around for Lamilos, a horse that won the Hennessy a few years back. Got lots of talent. The other horse I like here is Iker Allen. Smart juvenile hurdler. Hasn't really shown it in open company, but remains well handicapped if he's capable of performing as well as he did in the Triumph and Fourth a few years back behind Votor. Hopefully he can run well for Willie Mullins. My personal highlight on Thursday is going to be the Ryanair chase, as I really like Envoy Allen to retain his crown in this event for Henry de Bromhead. Travelled beautifully en route to beating Shishkin in this event 12 months ago. Campaigned with the race in mind, and he was only just fended off by Jerry Kalam last time. Been freshened up since. And quite frankly, I don't see why he shouldn't be 3-1, to 7-2 favourite. Still currently 9-2 to right now. Are you with me, Ross? Uh, I'm not yet with you, TC, but having been sort of pretty against you in the preview pod uh, this ground is not going to suit Bambridge who was my sort of uh, most likely winner so I, I do see the appeal um, stage star is, is up there in the market I don't fancy him at all largely because of the presence of protector and a hoy senor for that for that matter but that gives me even more confidence in a horse I've been shouting about since I don't know when fugitive um, he's going to love this ground He's got Sean Bowen on board. He's got cheap pieces on board. He's going to have a really strong pace to run at. Um, that is no doubt. This is a horse that will be over three miles next year. Rich Thompson has his yard in, in good form. Um, I'd be really disappointed if Future couldn't at least make the first three. And I really think he's got it in him to be as good as uh, any of these in here. Yeah, he ran excellent last year, went second in the plate and gets Sean Bowen. 28 to 1 on Fugitive, a fair price. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes, makes my 33 to 1 anti-post look less, uh, less smart, but uh, that's just uh, people not recognising the talent he is, I think. The featured stayers heard was up next. This division's been floundering in recent years. We've talked about it numerous times on the Ultimate podcast, on the Channel Preview pod, on all different podcasts. But this year's much more enticing, much better renewal, some new faces on the scene. However, the favourite is T. Hupu, who finished third in this race last year. Heads to the market at a relatively short price, around 7-4. to four. Is he for you? No, he's not. He said, I, I, well, I see, the, I see the logic, absolutely, and I can see why he's favourite. But he didn't win it last year, and I thought he had perfect conditions. Um, I think this looks a little bit deeper. Um, he beat Imperi Pass in the Hatton's Grace. Well, that 
you know, in, in hindsight, might, might not have been the best bit of form. It's going to have to deal with younger horses like Cranboat. Um, after what Emmett Mullins did with uh, Corbett's Cross the other day, it's got me very fearful of of Noble Yates. I think, you know, you can't just credit what improvement Emmett can find with these horses throughout the season. Um, I like Sir Gerhard. I think he'll cope with the ground. I think he is a horse that will stay this trip. Um, he's promised to be a very high-class individual. Willie Mullins clearly has them all in great order. So he's for me, but it's probably a race I'll watch. And in truth, and this is a sort of terrible pun I am TC, that if Paisley Park and Sir Gerhard are there together coming to the last, I'd probably end up cheering for Paisley Park just because I'd, I'd love to see it. But uh, it'd be a good race, but it's not a race that's got me excited from a punting perspective. No, nor me. There is, there is a horse in here that I do like in Home by the Lee at 14 to 1. First time blinkers go on for Joe's Fair Brian. We've already seen one Joe's Fair Brian plot job, uh, plot job this week um, with Lark in the Morning on Tuesday. So hopefully this horse can do something similar. They are completely different types. Obviously, you had a young hurdler. Home by the Lee is the opposite, more of a veteran now. But he ran very well when fifth in this race last year. Made a crucial mistake going past the stands. Not like El Fabiola on Wednesday, but still pretty bad. Hopefully, with a clean round of jumping, he can go close. Onto the plate now. Theatre Man has been the talk of the town for this event in all the previews. Um, if you were on the preview circuit, watched a few of these uh, analysts and, and punters talking about horses they like, Theatre Man was regularly being named, but he's second favourite in the race. The favourite is Crebley, who's actually going to be my pick in here for John Joe O'Neill and Jason McManus. Testing ground form is crucial, what we've seen so far. It looks pretty deep there, albeit they are switching courses. He has it. Crebley won on heavy ground last time at Exeter, beating two nice rivals. He also finished sixth in the EBF final last year in a race that threw up Crambo and a whole plethora of other winners. I'm going to take seven to two on this jolly. Do you like him as well? No, I don't, TC. I've, I've got a bit of a, a issue at the moment with the John Joe O'Neill form in general. And John Joe O'Neill Jr. on chases actually in, in large field handicaps are just not sure he gets him into the best rhythm consistently. Um, Scott Form obviously in behind Ginny's Destiny, as has Theatre Man. I think that the two lines of form are vastly different. Theatre Man ran in behind Ginny's Destiny, who is a horse that's improved all through the season, whereas Cribilli at the start of the year was, I think, facing an inferior version of Ginny's Destiny. So I, I do see the appeal of Theatre Man. I was surprised they were entertaining the Ultima at the, you know, <laughs> last week. I couldn't see him stay in this. I think this is much more his trip. So I see the appeal of him. I perhaps will chance him a little bit. But also, an, I say an old friend of mine has let me down a couple of times, but in excelsis Dio, I'm sure he's going to appreciate this step up in trip. Um, and I just wonder whether this is a JP, watch my left hand and, and don't spot my right hand. Um, Jonathan Burt perhaps wasn't on his best in last time at this track. Um, this trip, I think, will suit. The ground will suit. As we said, a little bit of a concern about Harry Fry's form coming into the festival. But... He's a decent enough price, so those would be my two for that. Yeah, I can see in Excelsis Dio for sure. I did look at him, and I thought you might put him up as well, but I'm going to stick with the first string. Wouldn't be surprised if the second string did win, I have to say. He's got a nice profile, albeit he did unseat last time up. The Mayor's Novices Hurdle is the penultimate race on the penultimate day of the festival, and it could be a match between Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott. We've seen it all before this week, and it looks like Gordon Elliott actually has the stronger hand this time with brighter days ahead. Willie Mullins has the unbeaten Jade de Grugy, now, only two pounds separates them on official figures. Neither horse has been beaten. Brighter Days Ahead has the extra experience of one more run. Yet there's disparity in the price. Who do you prefer? I've been with Brighter Days Ahead. It, it, she's really impressed with what she's done. And I was very taken by sort of the, the regard which Jack Kennedy clearly held her in um, from her performances. I think she'll set a strong pace. The juice in the ground will really suit her. The new course will, will definitely suit her. I think she's the one they've got to go and beat. I'm sat in quite a nice position with Golden Ace. Um, I, I put her up anti-post before she made her second uh, win, at, or got her second win at Taunton, I should say. Um, and that form is looking good. Lucky Place is one of the few Henderson horses to run well. He ran well in the in the Coral Cup. She beat him comfortably at uh, Taunton on her first start over hurdles. I think she's a, a real live player. Got a bit to find with Desar Enos in terms of bumper form, but... You know, as we've seen time and time again, you know, when they have to start jumping, that can bring them close together. So I like her, but for me, it's brighter days ahead. Brighter days ahead, currently six to four. Golden Ace is 14 to one. I'm going to side with Jade DeGruji. We can have a bit of a face off again with these two jollies. I just think they should be seven to four each of two rather than six to four brighter days ahead, nine to four Jade DeGruji. Not much separates them in my opinion. So value dictates I go with Willie Mullins' runner. Finally, we get to the curtain raiser on Thursday, the Kim Muir handicap chase. Four to one, the favourite. I know 
the way you're thinking for Gavin Cromwell. Off top weight, carrying 12 stone on a step up in trip. Is he taking your fancy? Yeah, you've got to respect Gavin Cromwell. No, it's probably a race I'll sit out, TC, unless the bit of rain their forecast stays away and, and the, the ground has dried out, which it has today. You know, it's definitely a little bit uh, better today than it was yesterday. If it's better again tomorrow and was getting towards a nice sort of good to soft, I would chant, am I right, for uh, Henry de Bromhead. Really taken by him on a couple of starts. I think Stirrup Leather broke at this track back in... Uh, in December, um, he's a, clearly a high-class horse. He's been tried in some sort of interesting races. Um, so for me, uh, am I right in the Kimura? If the ground comes good, it's a race I will wait to the very last minute to play once I've really convinced what the ground is like. Yeah, people say lucky last or get out get out of trouble stakes. This is not a get out of trouble stakes. Very tricky. The Kimura always is every single year. Am I right? It's currently 11 to 1 for Ross, potentially. I'm going to stick with a horse who's a little bit shorter in the market, 10 to 1 in Angel's Dawn. She won this race last year. She sauntered into contention 12 months ago, loomed up large on the outside, got into a battle in the final 100 yards up the hill, but fended off her rival. This looks like it's been the aim ever since. And I know that she got, she's gone up in the weights, but she gets on well with the jockey, which isn't proven for all horses in here. She stays. She likes the track. Hopefully Angel's Dawn will be a solid each way play in the finale. That's day three, done and dusted. What's your nap next best on Thursday, please? So the nap is going to be brighter days ahead. Really impressed by her. I think she'll get the job done. I take on board what you're saying that she probably is a little bit short. Maybe she'll out to a better price tomorrow with uh, William Mullins Fever taking rage and, and shortening up Jade de Grugy. And then my next best, I'm going to play in each way next best, which is Fugitive in the Ryanair chase. Perfect. My day three nap is Envoy Alain in the Ryanair at 250. And my next best is Iker Alain in the Temps final at 210. Two LNs. Hopefully, it's a good day for the Allens. One final offer for you to know about all new SBK customers can get £30 in free bets for the Cheltenham Festival when you place a £10 bet. Please join us once again on Thursday evening for our action on Friday. We'll hopefully end off the 2024 Cheltenham Festival with a few winners. Until then, best of luck with all of your bets. 